Well, this is Good Shepherd Sunday in the church year. We see we've read the 23rd Psalm. Well, this is a, generally the lesson appointed for this Sunday every year. And so we're going to be talking about the Good Shepherd, a shepherd and sheep. <clears throat> now, I want to share something here. Smartphone. A lot of people carry these and use these all the time, right? Step back with me a few years to 1980. <clears throat> 1980. And maybe you were gathered with some of your relatives, uh, your parents, if, if they were alive, or uh, friends, brother, sister. And in 1980, if somebody pulled out one of these and said, well, why don't you use my phone? What would people think? What's he talking about? Number one, they wouldn't know what this is, right? Then you say, well, I'd like to take some pictures of you. The people gathered there. And people, it's okay. And so you hold this up. And they say, where's the camera? They wouldn't know what you are talking about. And then you said, well, I need to check some items on my computer. That's really what this is. This is a handheld computer that connects you to the world. And by then, they aren't even wondering what, what's going on with Uncle Fred. <laughs> they wouldn't understand any of this. Because in 1980, none of this was here. Now, I'm trying to think. I don't know, 1980, you maybe would know more, yeah, computers, was it just kind of starting or some in use, but not massive use? or PCs and very, very slow okay. data rates. Okay, PCs and very slow data rates, but maybe your Uncle Fred was leader in the game and he knew about it. I share that with you, because we're talking today about a shepherd and sheep. And I don't think any of us here has a clue about that. I really don't. Everything I know about it, I've read in books. Theological books. And I don't know how much they know about shepherds and sheep either. Really. And yet this is a common image in scripture. Why? Because back when Jesus spoke this word, a lot of people would have known about shepherds. And they would have known about sheep and their characteristics. Just like a lot of people carry these and live on these day by day. I was looked in a newspaper a couple of days ago. There was an article on the Sudan. You know, a lot of conflicts in the countries in Africa, poor, struggles with the military, all kinds of stuff going on. Here there's a whole group of ladies sitting down here and look like a dirty dirt street. And half of them were on their phones. And I went, how did they get the phones in the Sudan? And how good is their backup system? I just kind of wondered to myself, you know. The world has really changed. But back to my point, shepherd and sheep. Now, I don't even know how much you know about sheep. So I'm working on this sermon this week. So Friday night, I'm watching the agriculture show out of... Uh, <laughs> Iowa Press, Iowa Public, you know. So. And the first leadoff story is on sheep in America. I couldn't believe it. You know, I learned a lot. Now, I pass like three farms when I come here every Sunday where I see sheep on them. Now, I don't know how many they have. I don't know if they're raised uh, to be slaughtered or if they're raised for wool. I don't know, but I pass them. Well, this was from Nebraska. And it was talking about uh, kind of the stress that sheep farmers were under because they couldn't make any money. And they talked to one sheep farmer. He said within 20 miles of where he lived, three farmers had gone out of business in the last year. Then I learned something I didn't know either. You know, most of the lamb and the mutton that is consumed in the United States comes from foreign countries, not our country. It costs too much money to produce it here. 
Most of it comes from Australia. I didn't know that. Did any of you know that? Well, that is the way it is. But that's totally different of raising sheep or in, in these bins and that, like pigs or whatever, than it is being out in the countryside. And we come back to shepherd and sheep in the time of Jesus, where one shepherd basically lived with his herd 24-7. I mean, that was kind of his family. Matter of fact, I was, uh, I don't know if shepherds even had or could be married or have children. They probably could, but they were never home because they were out wandering in the countryside with their flock and had to be involved with them every day. It's something like a dairy farmer. You know, at first, the congregation where I interned in, there was a number of dairy farmers. And I would go down on my days off. I learned so much about farming. You know, I got to drive tractors. It was really something. And, uh, but you know, I learned a dairy farmer never gets a day off. 365 times, twice morning and night, they have to milk those cows. Oh, maybe one of their brothers from down the road comes for two days when they have to go to a wedding. But it's, you are really committed. You are really involved. You are really engaged. Your life is every day with those, with those animals on your farm. Now, Jesus says, he is a good shepherd. And there's three things I can just say very clearly uh, to you that I want to communicate today. And that is that the good shepherd knows you better than anyone else. Number two, the text says, seeks to protect you from harm and danger. And number three, the good shepherd is willing to lay down his life for the sheep he did on Calvary's cross. I don't know if you've noticed, but we've kept the crucifix. I, uh, we're going to talk about the Catholic Church today. But this has become over my life, you know, raised in the Lutheran Church with an empty cross, as most Lutheran churches. This is much more meaningful to me because it reminds me of the suffering and the death of Jesus who laid down his life for us. The good shepherd was willing to die for us. He did die for us. And I, all I can say, and I pray you too, thanks be to God. But back to the text. Did you ever, I don't know if you, my wife says I think too much. Did you ever wonder if Jesus would he, here, would he be carrying one of these? <laughs> well, what would he be looking at? I wonder. Anyway, back to the, uh, to the text. Look at that verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know I ask you to really think about that. Does that kind of scare you or does that appall you or does that? Can you imagine a God of a universe that the physicists tell us is expanding into infinity? Try to get your head around that one. A God that transcends all galaxies and all time knows each individual person as if they were the only one on the planet. What is, the, again, I'm, you must think I'm a school teacher, not a preacher, but what is the present population of the planet? Is it five, six billion, more? Eight? Eight billion, somewhere? Eight billion? Eight to nine billion people on planet Earth. Now the text says that he knows us. That means he knows you. Personally, if he truly is God, all those big words we use, omnipresent, transcendent, then God can do what 
is beyond human understanding or conceptual uh, perception. So it's possible, but this says it's reality. I know my own and my own know me. So my question, who, who really knows you? Think about that. I, I, I'm very sincere about this. Who really knows what's going on inside you? Your parents might have saw some. If you're married and a spouse, but people don't share everything with their spouses. You know, again, like I, I talked about that marriage encounter a couple weeks ago. People have been married 40 years, 40 years. They go to a marriage encounter weekend. They're talking to their spouse and they, people just sit there. I never knew you felt that way. I, I, I just didn't know. Who knows you? If there's one person, one physical person that really knows what's going on inside your head, I mean, the stuff you never talk about, the stuff you're still really hurt over, the things that didn't work out, The fears you have that maybe the dementia you saw in your father will soon be coming upon you. Or maybe you're just afraid to drive a car. You don't tell anybody that. They'll say, well, that's kind of foolish. Hmm. Who really knows you? And why we don't want to tell people? Because the question, if they really knew what was going on up here, would they still be my friend? Would they still call to check in how I was doing? You know, people carry a lot of things. One day in talking to a lady, she had, was aware of a murder that had taken place in her family. She had never revealed that, but she was aware of it. And if she did reveal it, everything would kind of blow apart. Now the good news here, although it might scare you, is that God does know. I mean, really knows. Every thought, every feeling, every hurt, every struggle, every doubt. I know my own, and my own know me. And we think of a lot of nasty things. I shouldn't say these things, but I see some of these people on television, and I said, I'd like to shoot that person. There's a lot of people that really get me wound up in this world anymore. I read some of these books. I read a lot of books, you know. And I say, if we got all these people that are these trained assassins, why can't we get rid of a few of these really <laughs> evil monsters? Now, I don't go sharing this with everybody. Just the congregation. Get this. <laughs> but that's what I'm thinking. <coughs> Some people will go through a whole lifetime mad as you know what, that their father just never liked them. Love their sister. Praise their brother constantly. But he was never good enough. Never good enough. Never good enough. And never <clears throat> forgot. I remind you again, Jesus says, I know you. Don't let that scare you. Because remember, I love you deeper and fuller and more totally than you have even begun to perceive. No thought, no action, no doubt is ever going to chase me away or stop me from 
loving you. You know how much I love you. No, maybe you don't. I do know what's going on. I do love you. And my love is stronger than anything that's going on in your life in the past, in the now, or in the future. Trust me. I know my own, and my own know me. And then the second point here is, it's a pretty dangerous world out there, and I'm going to protect you. The sheep were... A vulnerable. I mean, I've read this in books, okay? I don't know about sheep, but I know that they're both kind of dumb and erratic, and uh, they don't kind of do well in the natural world if somebody isn't watching them. Predators will come after them. So the shepherd always had to be looking for the wolf, for the one that would, you know, he always had to be aware of the few sheep that were always wandering off on their own. You only do that and know that when you live with people every day. You know the ones that will take the risk. You know the ones that will wander off. You know the ones that, but then you know the ones that are kind of asleep most of the time too. You know that. But the shepherd knows that. But it's dangerous out there because if you wander away from the flock, from water and food, and, and he can't find you, you will die. Or an animal will tear you apart, and you will die. It's a dangerous world. You hear a lot in the contemporary media about our young people nowadays. They are being raised in a very difficult and dangerous world. I even read of many people, they will not have children. They do not want to bring them into an environment like this. In a matter of days, I don't know if this is going to pass, but you maybe heard it on your way to church today. The bills that are moving through Congress and will probably be signed in a matter of days now regarding security. But what's attached to that? It's probably going to go through. A bill that's going to go after and limit TikTok. Or take it away from China. Why? It is one of the most destructive. No, I don't. But they say one of the most destructive media that young people have ever encountered, especially girls. Dangerous. And they don't even know how it grabs them holds them, seduces them, and in a sense, breaks them down inside. Dangerous world. As I drive, again, just, just driving over, I went through a little town. Of, I can't remember where the ball, Monmouth. <laughs> you know what I think? I, I go to all these little towns and Big homes, big trucks, big, uh, well, they used to be the little the travel trailers that they're all driving around all over the place. You know the danger I keep seeing there? The seduction of money and the seduction of leisure. How many people is that pulling away from God? They got to go away this weekend. They're pulling their little, whatever it is, out to some field and they sit there, and, you know. But isn't that a true danger? That if the devil distracts you and you just settle down in the midst of all your wealth and all your possessions and all your enjoyments, what happens? You forget this. You turn against this. You don't even want to hear about this. You said it, I, mean, I remember when you came on Easter. You said, what are all those kids doing over on the field? 
Our world is a dangerous place of direct, subtle, and background destruction. The devil is at work. Evil is real. You can just look at another thing that's happened in that. Gambling. And the pervasiveness on all sports, from college, professional, and the impact. But what does it do? Destroys lives, pulls people away from the center of life. Evil is real. It's a dangerous place. How does Jesus protect us in this danger? The word of God. The family of faith, daily prayer. You just read this scripture, the Ten Commandments. There is specific, direct guidance for our lives as to what we should and should not do that will honor God and bless others. And if we don't, will lead us to separation from God and separation from others. And to be with a family of faith that can encourage and support us amidst trials and testings. And to be in daily prayer with the one who really knows what's going on all the time with us. It is dangerous out there. But not just for teenagers. How many times have I said, get people in their 40s and 50s when they make it. They pay off that mortgage. There's 50 grand of disposable income. Be aware. The evil one will snatch you. Success is a devil's playground. And then the last one, and it's the most important thing about your good shepherd. It says he's willing to lay down his life for the sheep, and he contrasts that with the hired hand. Well, I'm only getting paid so much, so if we lose a few sheep, who cares? But that's not the way it is with God. Every one of us, every one of every time is important, so important, eternally important, now and forever important, that he died. He did die. He did lay down his life. And it was taken up again. And the message continues to go out. Remember Jesus Christ has died for you. He is your saving grace. He is risen from the dead. And let me say it again. Remember, Jesus Christ, your good shepherd, has died for you. He is your saving grace. And he is risen from the dead. That's the eternal answer. That's the forever now answer. God deeply engaged in the daily having taken care of the eternal. Three things I've tried to say. I hope you remember them. Number one, he knows you, but he deeply loves you. <laughs> and nothing will ever, ever, ever stop him from loving you. Number two, you and I live in a dangerous world. It's easy to slip away or walk away or just drift away from God. Stay close to scripture. Stay close to your family of faith. Be constant in prayer. And thirdly, he did die for you. Remember Jesus Christ has died for you. He is your saving grace. He is risen from the dead. I may not know much about shepherds in Palestine, nor do you. But I do know, and I know you know, that you have a good shepherd, a loving friend in Jesus the Christ. <laughs> Thanks be to God for the gift of Jesus Christ. Amen.